Good morning, class. Uh, welcome back. I'm going to get right after this and try to treat the few slides that I didn't get to uh, this morning as we were talking about changes in global trade patterns and what consequences those had for the Atlantic slave trade. In fact, partly this is the story of how the Atlantic slave trade is going to come to something close to a conclusion. Pardon me, I mentioned that, you know, we talk about the slave trade as though it's something in the past, and sadly there are um, countless instances of people who are experiencing life in some form of slavery, um, even to this day. And so uh, you'll note that in the uh, module just below this screencast, um, I'm putting an optional uh, miniature documentary on the challenges of the modern slave trade. And uh, anyway, if you choose to, to look at that, uh, feel free. Uh, to, this is our objective today. And as you know, we began and spent actually most of our time in class today wrestling with the idea of global trade and how it's changing in the centuries and decades um, prior to the American Revolution, French Revolution, Industrial Revolution, so on and so forth. <laughs> Pardon me. And uh, now I want to focus a little bit more uh, exclusively on slavery itself. So we talked about commodities in real short terms. I'm going to say that according to this documentary, um, essentially the discovery of silver by Europeans, it's really not actually true. I mean, the Americans, the natives in the Americas had already discovered silver and were using it but they were using it for its use value, meaning silver as an attractive metal that allowed elites to show prestige and it was sort of a special metal, but it was special because of its use. Um, when Europeans make that connection, they're going to be using silver for its exchange value, meaning not for its decoration and its um, majesty and impressiveness, but for its value, meaning I can store this stuff in a treasure chest or I can put it underground and know that I'm storing a form of wealth. Okay, so exchange value is a unique European, um, I shouldn't say it's uniquely European, but in terms of uh, the Native Americans, the European vision and view of precious metals was certainly something uh, new for them. But silver is going to reorient the global trade. It's going to bring China. China is going to have a demand for silver. So now China, after centuries of thumbing its nose or um, acting superior to European merchants, China will now welcome European brought silver, which is coming from American mines, for the most part, like this one in Potosi. Um, from American mines and largely produced by African labor. So there we have, at least in part, our slavery um, topic being featured. So your textbook and my comments here are aimed at discussing the end of slavery. Why does the Atlantic slave trade come to a conclusion by the mid-19th century? Well, there's no super easy, perfect, crisp answer to that, but we are going to try to highlight some of the explanations for why slavery, having exploded in the 16th and 17th centuries, why by the 18th and 19th centuries it is starting to um, shrink and decline. I think the first argument has to be one that's very much based on trade. The Industrial Revolution, as we know, which really picks up in 1750, starting in Great Britain, the Industrial Revolution, by definition, is a emphasis upon using machines to produce things. Now, this doesn't mean that humans become immediately obsolete, and it certain doesn't, certainly doesn't mean that all industries or all segments of the economy can do without human um, labor. But nonetheless, the Industrial Revolution does reduce the global demand for human labor. There are a lot of things that were previously done by humans that will now be done by machines. And as a result, 
the global demand for human labor goes down. That has some impact upon slavery as it had been practiced throughout the world up until this time. But that's not the only explanation by any means. There were moral arguments. Um, let's point out that slavery, uh, forced servitude, did not jive very well with the um, principles um, of the European Enlightenment. You know, all men are created with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and property, or if you choose Jefferson, pursuit of happiness. Well, that doesn't play very well with um, people being um, confined and bound to slavery. So that is part of it. But also on the element of practical arguments, people were also saying, you know what? Slavery just doesn't even pencil out. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's more expensive than the benefits of it. And so increasingly, we see both moral and even economic arguments against slavery. I mean, let's face it, when someone is enslaved, they still have needs for food, they have needs for shelter, they have uh, needs for clothing. Um, the slave owner has to provide for those things. If you free the slaves and then hire them back as workers, is it possible that you can actually um, turn a greater profit, not to mention the fact that person's going to have probably a greater incentive to produce. They will probably be more productive. So there were very practical arguments put forth. But on the moral side, um, abolition relied heavily on various groups. Key among them were the Quakers, which is a um, religious denomination. I'll spare you an explanation of precisely who the Quakers were. But they were people who very much um, were against violence, and slavery was not only morally reprehensible because it meant one man ruling over another, um, but it also was morally reprehensible because there was violence in that institution. And so the Quakers are going to take a leading role um, in calling attention to having slavery abolished, which is what the abolition movement was all about. So big breakthroughs start to happen in 1803. Denmark um, outlaws the slave trade within its um, realm. 1807, Great Britain follows suit. 1808, the United States outlaws the um, slave trade. France in 1814. And then in 1867, the um, Atlantic slave trade is um, discontinued, or at least it is no longer legal. And it's important to note that just because the slave trade ends, that does not mean that slavery ends. So in the United States in 1808, there was no longer a legal slave trade, but there was still slavery, right? So slaves can reproduce by natural increase. And so the slave populations that already existed in the United States were still enslaved. It's just that no new slaves are legally being brought from places like Africa and the Caribbean to um, be enslaved in the United States. Pardon me. The British Navy plays a really important role in world history at this time. They are largely enforcing the end of the Atlantic slave trade. So British ships are patrolling waters throughout the Atlantic. And if there is a slave ship, it's the British Navy, more, like, more likely than not, that is going to bring that illegal vessel to justice. And then finally, I'll say, and some of you already know this, in Africa, particularly places in the western part of Africa, Sierra Leone and Liberia, there are interesting experiments taking place where escaped slaves from the United States um, or also slaves that have um, received their freedom. Perhaps they've been manumitted by the slave owner has um, you know, freed their once um, owned slave captive uh, or perhaps a slave owner has died and um, it creates an opportunity for a slave to enter into freedom. Anyway, certain post-slavery projects are taking place on the west coast of Africa, and these are important um, 
they they reflect that time um, in an important way. Okay, this gives rise within Africa to what um, your textbook ref refers to as legitimate trade, and legitimate trade is essentially trade for resources or goods coming out of Africa that do not involve people. So legitimate trade is supposed to indicate trade that does not include the immoral institution of trafficking humans. Now in West Africa, which is largely the source of African, had been the source of African slaves across the Atlantic, um, where the Middle Passage had funneled over time as many as 15 million people. In the documentary today they said 12 million, um, but sometimes you'll hear the term as high as 15 million. Um, but the Middle Passage had resulted in millions of Africans being displaced from their home, from their um, clans, from their kingdoms in West Africa, and shipped to places farther west like the Caribbean or the uh, colonies or later United States. But now with the end of the Atlantic slave trade, Africa's economy is going to shift to the quote legitimate trade, which is natural resources like palm oil, peanuts, ivory, as you see pictures here. This probably wouldn't be thought of as legitimate trade today because much of the ivory trade is illegal in Africa. But at that time, it was a natural resource that was essentially deemed as a perfectly acceptable part of the global economy. Uh, so this helps Africa pivot a little bit, and we even have examples of former slaves like King Jaja of Opobo and William Lewis, who are people who go back and establish themselves as highly successful either government rulers in the case of um, King Jaja or as merchants in the case of William Lewis. So this seems to have a lot of promise, perhaps be a new day for Africa. However, not all is um, roses. Uh, we see here that when, because of, in part because of the Industrial Revolution, as free trade and free labor become the um, trademarks of the modern economy, like in Europe and in the United States, in Africa, the slave trade in many ways intensifies. You can imagine suddenly the void, the trafficking of humans had been a very profitable and lucrative industry within Africa. And the infrastructure of capturing and selling slaves did not immediately go away. In fact, within Africa, slaves are going to experience an uptick. Um, it's just African slave traders are no longer trading with outside merchants. They're now trading with internal customers for African slaves. And you'll see that almost half the population in different places is going to be enslaved. And these are some of the different ways in which these slaves will work within Africa. Some on African plantations, like palm oil uh, plantations. Others will become um, enslaved soldiers fighting on behalf of kings who are busily protecting their turf and protecting their trade interests in Africa. And then also people to transport the um, commercial products that are part of the quote unquote legitimate trade inside of Africa. Nigeria you see here. Um, in the U.S., you know, in 1850, the United States probably had about 3 million slaves, I would say, in the south, in the plantation south of the United States, and northern Nigeria exceeds that. So it gives you a sense of how African slavery is um, making its mark. Okay, with that, I'm going to call it good for today. Um, we have talked a little bit about the concluding... Uh, elements of the African slave trade, and that'll set the stage for our comments tomorrow as we look back to the Industrial Revolution. So thank you.